Hi, my name is Alex Carlucci. I'm here with Dale Ellentoni, and we're with Gustin Cho Associates, and we are mortgage brokers, and we're licensed in 48 states, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands. Um, I want to talk to you today about the mortgage underwriting process, but I'd like to start with the pre-approval first because that's important too. This mortgage underwriting process is really silly, and a lot of people don't really understand what they're about to get into, and maybe if you understand the whole process, you can plan for your purchase well ahead of time, understanding what you're going to be going through. Um, so let's talk about how we start the loan process as a loan officer. So we are loan officers. We don't make the decision on the loan. We, we're like on your side. We want you to close the loan. The underwriter wants to make sure that the work that we do in pre-approving you is accurate and, and they terrorize the whole process. They want to make sure it's exactly what, what, what the loan officer submitted to them. So what we do is we get a phone call from you and you say, hey, I do this for a living. I have this much money. I want to buy this much house. I have this much debt. Then I do a little quick math, that, you know, scratch paper, and I say, oh, you're pre-qualified. I, I like to send you an application. So then I'll email you an application, and you'll fill it out. You'll give us, you know, authorization to run your credit. And then we'll run your credit, and we'll ask for your income docs and your asset docs. Now, credit, income, and assets are very complicated. It's not a simple thing. You may think, hey, I'm making hundred grand a year, but you made twenty grand last year, and you're selling cars, and you're 100% commission. You don't make hundred grand a year. Or you might have job gaps, or you might have switched to 1099 or, or back and forth to W-2 or self-employed, open a business. There's so many complications to income. Same thing with assets. You got a $6,000 cash, you know, borrowed from your parents, put it in your bank account. That's not usable money. Unless you, if there's cash, that's not usable. So we have to look at your assets. So you got, you know, income, job history. And then when it comes to credit, there's all sorts of nuances on credit. You could have collections, charge-offs, you know, student loans in default, mortgage lates, car lates, you know, all sorts of things that we have to analyze. So what we do is we do our best to say, hey, this loan makes sense based on all the rules that I know. And then what we do is we, we write your pre-approval and then you go buy a house or refinance, we'll just submit the loan. But if it's a purchase, write your pre-approval, you go buy a house. And then we submit all that paperwork, bank statements, W-2s, um, your credit report, your purchase contract, and then we give it to a bank. And then the, what they're going to do is they're going to submit this loan to a disclosure desk. And then they're going to send you out disclosures. And this one I always struggle with because when they disclose a loan, it looks like 10 times more expensive than it's really going to be. And that's because of these rules that the regulators put against mortgage brokers after the 2008 collapse that we have to disclose fees to you that we have nothing to do with the title company, the appraisal, all, nothing. We have, we're not charging them to you, but they over disclose them to you because if they under disclose them to you as a lender, you have to pay the difference if you under disclose. So we Alex, have to these, go ahead. Let me add something. So a lot of times, as you know, we get seller credits on deals, right? So for example, yeah. you're getting $10,000 from the seller to contribute towards closing costs. Right. You'll find almost every time that in, when the lender initially discloses the loan, they, re, they don't include those closing cost credits Absolutely. because they're trying to protect themselves from not under disclosing and they'll yeah. add it later in the process. But right. in fairness to the people listening here and those who don't do this every day, it's alarming when they see these figures come through to them. But I always try to reassure people that this is an inflated number. The real numbers will come in. And you know what? We're going to review the CD together before you go to closing. But go right. ahead. So, yeah, so I always tell my customers they have to trust me, and I hate saying that. I hate saying the words trust me or have faith in me. Uh, this is the way it is, and sometimes I have to prove it to them by Googling it, but it's, it's a really uncomfortable position if you don't address it before the disclosures go out, and it happens quite a bit, but understand that mortgage brokers cannot charge or inflate fees and make more money. We are regulated. We can make a fixed amount on every loan. All these fees that are being charged you on a purchase of a home that are run up to nine, ten, fifteen thousand dollars, they're all third party charges. Nothing that we have anything to do with. If you went to another bank, it'd be the same. So if you really want to be savvy on how to look at mortgage broker to mortgage broker, there's a box A on these disclosures, and that's underwriting fee, discount points, processing fees, whatever. That's the only place that you should be shopping when you're going from mortgage company to mortgage company, because I've been beaten out on a loan because they quoted lower title fees by $500 because they took a chance on the disclosing that. And I, I lost the loan when I had nothing to do with the title charges. My, my other charges were actually cheaper. So he would have saved money with me, but the other person manipulated because he got a copy of my 
estimate and he undercut it. So understand there's a lot of nonsense like that. We are just making up 90% of the fees because that's the, the way the process works in the beginning. That's, that's Alex, yes. let, let me add a couple of things to it. So, you know, like going reeling back here, when we initially talked to someone, we're taking an application, we're collecting their income docs, we're trying to get the best understanding of what their overall situation is. We then run automated underwriting to determine, do we have an automated approval or do we have to do a quote unquote manual underwrite? If it's a manual underwrite, we may be asking for other things. But what I usually like to tell people, you know, because calculating income is one of the most important parts of this. So we make sure we're putting people in the right direction, looking for houses. I always like to say, hey, Alex, if you're the borrower, hey, if you can get me your 2021 and 20 or let's say 2022 and December pay stub for this year, 2023, because if you've been at your job for over two years, it's going to give me an itemized breakdown of your bonuses over time and other things that we call variable income along with your base wages. So that's a little, if some, if you can you know, be cognizant of trying to get that, that helps us in really narrowing down and determining your income. Obviously, rental history is very important if you can verify it. Usually, if you're a rent from a management company or an apartment, you can get what we call a mortgage supplement. If you're old school and you got canceled checks, we'll take that as well. But those are some things um, that you need to be aware of. And obviously maintaining your credit, you know, especially if you're getting a manual underwrite, late payments on revolving debt and installment debt could hurt you. But go ahead, Alex. All right. So, yeah, so I always, you know, I another important thing that you should, the loan officer should do is understand what the real cash to close is going to be at the end and how much money does your borrower have? Because I see a lot of problems at the end that the borrower doesn't have enough money and people are scattering for gifts. The gift funds come over, then they rerun the automating underwriting findings that it gets denied because gift funds aren't as powerful as your own funds. So there's all sorts of nuances in the beginning that the loan officer should address. But this is what happens. So after we take all the documents and then we submit it and you get disclosed and you, you, you sign those disclosures, it goes to underwriting. Then we can order the appraisal. Then we start ordering title and insurance. So there's an appraisal that gets ordered by a third party company. The, the file goes to underwriting. I'm telling you to start shopping for insurance. And so like two or three days later, you get a, approval from the bank. And on that approval, it's going to ask for title, which the sellers provide usually. And it's going to ask for the appraisal. It's going to ask for your insurance. But it's also going to ask for verification of employment from your company. And so that's the holy grail. These pay stubs and W-2s that we pre-approve you on, it's not the holy grail. Those, those verification of employments are... That they show monsters that we can't see as loan officers. They, they, we find out the hard way that you were that you were all commissioned last year, or, or you're all commissioned. I mean, all sorts of weird things find uh, come out. So, so we, when the, Alex, let me yeah. let me add to that right there specifically. How late in the process will underwriting or lenders verify employment? A couple of days before at the very end, correct? Well, that's a verbal verification at the a end. Verbal, right? Yeah. They want to make sure you're working. Somebody's thinking about making a job change during the mortgage process. That's what I'm. That's where I'm going here. So, so the underwriter is going to ask for that verification of employment, and that, and sometimes that makes me as a loan officer look bad because I didn't realize I should have asked that question, and it shows a monster. Now maybe you don't qualify, and now we're like scattering to pay off some debt to make you qualify because they chop your income. But also they do a background check. It's the first underwrite. They do. They have things called Lexus Nexus or. I don't know what they're called, but anyway, they have a background check. They find out about bankruptcies, foreclosures, IRS liens, judgments. You own a business. You own other properties you didn't disclose. They find everything. I tell people that unders are, underwriters are Santa Claus. They know when you're sleeping. I tell them that the white balloons that are flying over America are underwriters. They're watching you. So they know everything nowadays. They have artificial intelligence that we don't have as loan officer. We pre-approve you. So again, be honest with your loan officer because that very- They're going to find time, out. They're going to find out. Yeah. So you want us to know what they're going to find out before they find out before we know, because we can get around things in a, in a, in a the righteous kind of way, but we have to know, be prepared what to tell you to do. So maybe go on a payment plan. If you have a judgment, you know, we can get ahead of problems versus them coming up during underwriting process and you already have a contract. So let us know things, you know, you want to be honest with your loan officer, because that's, that's one of the, the big things in the underwriting process. They find that background check. That's something we don't know. You know, we don't we don't know that stuff. It's, it's it's really invasive. I start asking you a million questions. Do you owe the IRS? Do you have child support? Do you own any other properties? I don't believe you. Do you have a business? You know, you know, there's too many questions that we have to ask you 
that it becomes really annoying. So we, we want, we just ask you like, nice, is there something else we should know? Da, da, da. So we, we're counting on you to have a good relationship with us because the underwriters find everything. So anyway, full so transparency. What after that, yeah. yeah, full transparency. Because the underwriters are going to find out. So once we get the appraisal back, once we satisfy these underwriters' conditions, they want verification employments. They want to see the earnest money check clearing your bank account. They want to see they have enough funds to close. If you get gift funds, they want to see the whole process of the donor giving it to you. All this paper trail, um, updated pay stubs, updated bank statements, uh, credit explanations about what's going on in your credit. So there's there's things on your credit report that shows them that you inquired for credit. They want to make sure you didn't get debt that they don't know about. So we have to satisfy all these conditions. So when the appraisal comes in, the title comes in, you give us insurance, and we give the underwriter all these conditions that they're asking for, then we throw we throw them in a pile back at the underwriter, and then they recondition for something else. They, they just keep, they're not, it's not easy. It's not one and done. So that's why it takes Alex, 30 days. Yeah. How many, on average, would you say, how many times do we have to resubmit back to an underwriter before we get our clear to close? What would you say your experience 99%. Oh, so there's never a one touch file. Never had a one touch. There's right. Many, but how many yeah. touches would you say? Three? Three's average. Four, three average, average. Yeah. The tougher loan six. You know, the tougher loan six. Yeah. So oh yeah. What what do you mean by what he means by touches is that we submit everything to the underwriter that we think is perfect and they find something wrong. And you know, ninety-nine times out of a hundred, they're right. They're really good. I, I tell people, I don't know why underwriters are underwriters making 70 grand a year. They should be FBI agents you know, making 200 grand a year with a pension for the rest of their lives because they find things that F, they're like FBI agents. They find a needle in a haystack in a field. They're that good. They just, they're, they're really detailed oriented and they make sure they'll find a period, not, at, you know, after misses your name, MRS period. Where's the, where's the dot? Where's the dot? You know? So they're, that's how crazy underwriting is. And the, so clients think that we're horrible and this process is so stressful. Why, what, what, you know, should I cancel the process? Is, is, is something wrong with me? No, it's just paper pushing. We're not, there's nothing wrong with you. It's just a really tedious process because these underwriters don't want to miss anything. And I'm, when I say anything, it's silly stuff, really silly because they've had problems selling these loans because of some period being missed on, on the- Alex, on Alex, what happens if an underwriters, you know, underwrites loans that don't perform? What happens to that they, underwriter? They lose their license. I mean, that's, yeah. that's they're, they're looking out for their job, especially on the government loans. You know, they're real, they're, the government's, you know, they're insuring these things. So there's a short lease on them making, uh, you know, they're called buybacks. And the, the, the FHA won't buy it from them. So then their bank has to take on that loan and service it when they, that's not the job that the business they're into. They're not into collecting mortgage payments. They're in packaging the loan up and selling it for a little, little profit. And they don't want to, you know, collect your payments for 30 years. There's big corporations that do that. So they sell it off to those big companies. So, so when you're going through the process, it may seem uh, unfair, but it, it's the underwriter for uh, their protection and your protection as the borrower have to thoroughly vet the file. They just do. They just do. Yeah. And we've learned painfully through our own experiences more often than not, we'll get them what they ask. Sometimes we push back on them, but you know, more often than not, uh, we could see what they're looking at and agree with them. And I describe underwriters as like English teachers. You never know. I mean, some underwriters are easier and some underwriters are tougher. Picture when you were in, in fourth grade and you had to write, a book report on the book you just read and you wrote a really good report and your teacher gave you an F. You could have taken that same book report to a different teacher and maybe gotten an A. That's underwriting. So you never hey, know. Alex, what you're talking about there is underwriter's discretion. No, what you're talking about is people have different styles. Right. But they they discre oh, so they look at they have a different you know, lens the, that they're looking some at. People things. Care. Right. Well, no, it's, it, it's so dynamic that that one person looks at a, a something that's completely different in the way, the way right. their, their method is to go through a file. Some underwriters probably really focus on the bank statements and terrorize the bank statements. Some people terrorize the income. Some people, if you got an 800 credit score, a million dollars in the bank, your conditions are going to be three or four. If you got a 502 credit score and all sorts of weird deposits going in and out and you're bouncing some checks and your job hopping around, they're going to spend a lot of time punishing it. But sometimes underwriters are easy. Like, wow, I thought that was going to be a really terrorized loan and the, that underwriter was really nice. So it's you just luck of the draw, the mood they're in, you know, the... The, the pressure they've been under lately. I don't, who knows? I mean, underwriting is very objective, I guess. Is that the right word? Is Alex, it how important is it to package a file well for to ensure a smoother process? Right. 
Right. So what you have to understand that we talked to you for an hour or three days, five days in a row, we're gathering docs, we're asking a thousand questions. And we take that pile of junk and throw it at the underwriter. She didn't talk to you. So the more clear you make it to the problems that I saw going through the pre-approval process to make it clear to the underwriter. So what are the things I do with my loans? I do a processor cert. So I have my processor write a story about how this thing, what, how I saw, see this loan is put it all together, this pile of mess. And that way, that if they have that clarity, they know what to look for versus them trying to look at just paperwork and try to figure out, I got a thousand questions here. I don't understand what I'm looking at. So, so give them a little narrative when you submit the loan if it's complicated. But yeah, so you absolutely have to paint the picture. You got yeah. to understand these people don't know anything about the, you know, the individual that's being submitted or a couple. Therefore, you, we as a loan officer have to paint a picture so they can gain a better understanding. Yeah. So the reason that loans take 30 days to close is because they're verifying everything. They're just making sure everything is exactly right. Your pay, your addresses, your your work history, your where you lived for the last five years, what the, the credit explanations on why you ran your credit two days before you applied for a mortgage with a car company. Did you buy a car? They just want to verify everything. Are yeah, Alex, let's talk about that. Have you ever had a clear to close and then right at, in between the time from clear to close and closing, somebody uh, acquired new debt? I've had all sorts of problems after clear to close. So I, you have to follow these loans right down to the end. In fact, this week I had a problem. Clear to close, there's a refinance. Went to went, I scheduled it. They, they balanced the CD with title on last Wednesday. Everything looked great. Monday morning comes. It's going to close Monday night at their house. The title company says, hey, I, find a, I found a contractor's lien on title. I can't close this until it's satisfied. I mean, the whole thing was done. But they, it, it never ends. So the title company got in the way, not the underwriter. They found something really late in the game. I don't know why they didn't find it three weeks before that, but they found it the day of closing. So she had a call. She she shopped for windows and decided not to get the windows, but the contractor put a lien against them for the work he did, like a thousand dollars for you know going out and giving the estimates. They, they 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 said yes, and then they canceled it. But the guy ordered permits, so he wanted his money back. For the permits of a thousand dollars so she had to pay it we had to get a recent lease a lien we're closed it last night but it delayed it for two days so anything can happen with these things there's so many things that can go wrong with these loans and that's it's it's really crazy how how this works and we apologize we're not doing this to you it's the it's the system this is whoever set it up i don't know who they are but they need to be you know talk to <laughs> well the, the reality unfortunately the reality is and i've had this happen where We've gone through the process. We've gotten the clear to close. And then the underwriter comes out of left field before the closing and asks for something that they forgot they asked for before. That's that's the truth. I mean, it doesn't happen often, but we've all seen it happen. And the best thing to do is just hopefully you can get what you need and you keep marching forward. So here's the thing that really affects loans. Sometimes when you, you know, let's say that the underwriter thought that $15,200 was the cash to close. We verified fifteen thousand two hundred and fifty dollars in your bank account, so we're okay. You got, we got just enough by fifty dollars, and then it goes to the to the balancing of the closing, you know, the closing department of the bank, the close uh, the title company, and also the realtor throws in a five hundred dollar real estate fee for their company, and now that that was never known by us, and then now your cash to close is fifteen thousand five hundred. We only verified fifteen thousand two hundred, and there's instructions from the underwriter say cash to close can't be more than fifteen thousand two hundred. And now we got to do gift bonds. We're scatterbrating. I mean, this thing does not, this thing is an animal until you walk away from that closing table after signing. So just keep in mind, underwriting process is very difficult. It's not us, <laughs> you know. But anyway, let's say we get to all that point. Let's say we get the underwriter everything. Let's say we the appraisal's good. Everything, everything's perfect. And we go through a couple double, you know, more rounds of the underwriter asking for one more thing, one more thing. Once everything's satisfied, you get issued what's called a clear to close. And that's when everybody's happy. But again, there could be still problems after that, but not usually. And then once you get the clear to close, then we all celebrate. Then we schedule your closing. You go to the title company, you sign the paperwork, and you own your house. And that's that's the nightmare process of of, of pre approval all the way to the closing table. Bill, do you want to say anything? Yeah, you know what? I I will just say that uh, follow our lead. There's twists and turns through the process. You know, based on our experiences, we're trying to guide you in the best way possible. Unfortunately, we're all guilty until proven innocent. Even if Alex and I were going to get mortgages, we would go through the same process. So the best thing to do is, you know, just get as much documentation, package a file well up front. Don't open any new debt, even if you're clear to close. 
because they will catch it. And, you know, if the unfortunate circumstances, you have an asset issue, like Alex said, you're 300 hours off, we'll figure it out. But uh, really follow the lead of your loan officer. Yeah, that's it. That's all I say. That understand that your loan officer is your friend through this nightmare. Have faith in that person. Trust that person as long as they're making sense to you. Hopefully they're honest to you because if something does come up in the underwriting process and it does look bad, I am very clear to my consumer right up front. I don't bury it because you, these things all show their monster. You want to prepare them. You want to brainstorm with maybe they, they have a solution for it. Who knows? So you just got to have faith in your mortgage broker. Hopefully you get a good one. There are bad mortgage brokers out there. There are. So a lot of people don't understand that a 22-year-old mortgage broker can write you a pre-approval and he never should have. And that's, there's no jail time. For well, that that's kid. a big problem out there where some people write pre-approvals and they didn't really thoroughly vet the borrower. Yeah. So there's no law that, that puts that person in jail for making that mistake. And you just suffer and go through a, a horrible process and underwrite because of it. So vet your, vet your mortgage broker. Make sure they know what they're talking about. You don't well, want to go with, you, you, you don't want to go, you don't want to go with the lowest rate just because it's the lowest rate because there's a lot right. of companies out there that advertise the, the ridiculous rates is because they don't pay their loan officer any money and it's all automated and they're just, they just, they're order takers and they don't care if it doesn't close because the more applications they get in, the, the more volume they're going to close, but they don't care if 50% don't close. I want to bet 98%. These banks with low rates, they want to bet 50% and just get as much business and they close and they'll torture you and they'll pay someone $22 like they're ordering through a drive through at McDonald's. And that's how... These low rate banks work. You don't want that, especially if your file is complicated. They, yeah, they're just throwing stuff against the wall to see if it sticks. Yeah. The other thing is, I would say for both of us, um, that we could defend any pre approval we put out there and how we yeah. arrived to that decision. You know what I mean? Yeah, I feel like I got more experience than most underwriters, and I can battle. I know where my problems are going to lie in my in my loans, and know and prepared to battle them when if it does come up. So. I understand the underwriting, but it's so complicated. It's like IRS code that even I make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. It's, it's a very complicated business. Very complicated. And you know what? Everybody does make mistakes. And, the, you know, I would, I'll i be the first to admit it if I make one. You know, the thing is, you move forward, you be transparent on both sides, and more than likely, you'll have success if you do it. Right. All right, that's all I have to say today about the underwriting process. You, Dale, are you good? No, that's good. No, thanks. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll see you next Thursday for right before Christmas. We may, may or may not, I think we're going to do one next week before Christmas, but we'll see you next Thursday. And please like and subscribe to these videos. It helps us help you. Thank you very much. Thank you.